Welcome. In this segment, we'll look at estuarine ecology and estuarine ecosystems. Estuaries are very important components of marine ecosystems, and they are the places where rivers meet the sea. We can define estuaries as freshwater systems um, that are meeting the marine system where rivers are entering the sea in semi-enclosed basins. Um, and they've been officially defined as places that are semi-enclosed and have a connection between seawater and freshwater. Uh, estuaries are very important in terms of human interactions with eco marine ecosystems. Estuaries are traditionally places where humans chose to build cities because they are, have a source of fresh water and they often have nice harbors, safe harbors, and often they're associated with very productive marine ecosystems, so there was classically a source of food. So many major cities in the world are built on the edges of estuaries, such as New York and London. Um, if you think about many of the major world cities and their location, you'll realize they're coastal cities at a place where a river's entering the sea. And so estuaries are really important today in terms of human interactions with the marine system as well. The word estuary is derived from Latin words meaning uh, boiling tides, in part because as the tides come in and out and the river is coming coming into these estuarine areas, you get often some very complicated tidal patterns. And uh, traditionally, these could be hazards to navigation. And if you've ever been to a harbor, you may notice the harbor master sends out uh, tugboats and other uh, vessels to help ships navigate into, into these estuaries because with the shifting muddy sediment and the tides, they're often uh, complicated places, even for experienced sailors uh, and navigators to, to, to to be able to uh, navigate through to harbor. So we can divide estuaries into several types. Um, there are two major ways that estuary divisions are made. One is based on the geologic formation of the estuary, and the other is based on the patterns of salt and fresh water. So just so we understand some of the names of those estuaries that you may read in the literature, we're gonna go through first the geological and then the sort of physical or salinity-based characterizations of estuaries. Okay, so the first group of classifications is based on this interaction of climate and geology. And the first type of climate uh, geology uh, classification is as a coastal plain estuary. And co coastal plain estuaries are formed uh, after the last glaciation cycle when the sea level rose as the glaciers melted and they flooded river valleys. And the Chesapeake Bay is actually a giant estuary um, and uh, it's a good example of a coastal plain estuary. It's flat around that area. If you look at the figure here um, that was shown in the slide and you see um, the water in the Chesapeake Bay estuary and the Delaware estuary to the northeast of it, you'll notice that they're very dendritic and you can see rivers coming in and you can imagine this river that had run through the plain has been flooded as the sea level rose. The second type of estuary is going to be a tectonic estuary. Um, in tectonic estuaries, you also have the sea flooding into a region, but in this case, um, tectonic or motion of the earth action has caused a subsidence of the land. So a uh, good example is the San Francisco Bay Estuary. You all know there are earthquakes in California. Um, and in the geologic past, there were earthquakes that shook the unconsolidated sediments of the San Francisco Bay um, and caused them to fall and sink and seawater flooded in. So again, seawater has flooded this region, but it's not due to sea level rise, it's due to subsidence, um, due to motion of the earth. So we, if we look at a cross section, say, of the S San Francisco Bay Estuary, it would look more like this, where you can see underneath the area that's labeled C, um, uh, the down uh, the downfalling plate there and the subsidence of the land that allowed the sea to enter this river system. Another type of geologic classification of estuaries is lagoon estuaries. And we talked about longshore currents and uh, various forces that make sandbars uh, parallel to shore. And when sandbars are made parallel to shore, they can semi-enclose a region of the sea that is near where rivers are entering the sea. So you have these sandbars that are running parallel to the shore and rivers running into a semi-enclosed bay. 
And these are known as lagoon estuaries. Um, and good examples of these are along the coastal Carolinas. So here's a diagram from your book that shows the Pimlico Sound uh, and the sandbars that are dividing the uh, estuary that's fed by many rivers and the sea. So there's not complete exchange, uh, but there are these semi-enclosed basins there. Um, and, and these are often very productive ar areas. There's some also off the Texas and Florida coast. And so if we look here at a cross section, you can see again the deeper ocean offshore. The sandbar is dividing the ocean from the, sh the shore and from the river. And often in these, uh, uh, in these lagoon estuaries, we have a lot of uh, extensive tidal flats. And we talked about those in the previous section of intertidal ecology. So many times uh, there are extensive mud flats and tidal flats lining these lagoon, uh, these lagoon estuaries. The final geologic um, type of estuary that we're going to discuss is known as a fjord. Um, and these are very common in Norway and Chile and uh, off the coast of Alaska. And these are places where valleys were deepened by glacial action and became broad and met the sea. And any time where then you have connection of the sea coming into the entrance of that former river that's been widened by the glacier action, you can get this semi-enclosed place where rivers coming off the watershed are meeting the seawater that's coming in. Um, and so often there's a shallow sill. It could be the terminal moraine of the last glaciation or just a regular moraine or deposits that semi-restrict the water flow between the river mouth and form the semi-enclosed bay or estuary. In the U.S., we have some, in the mainland U.S., we have uh, one example of uh, a fjord. Uh, the United States Geologic Survey classifies the um, Puget Sound, one of the largest estuaries in the United States, as a fjord estuary. And this is uh, where Seattle is located. Again, major cities are often at these points where freshwater and saltwater interact. Um, and uh, this is a very deep um, estuary, as you would expect uh, in a place where glacial action had uh, scoured the basin. The second type of classification scheme that we're going to talk about, and here's a cross section of the fjord, very deep. These estuaries are often very deep. The second type of classification scheme um, that we're going to discuss is one based on the patterns of fresh and salt water. And the first type of that estuary is a salt wedge estuary. So you'll remember when we talked about the water density and what affects water density, that both temperature and salinity affected water density. The more saline the water, the denser it was. The cooler the water, the denser it was. So these differences in water density based on salinity and temperature are what are going to drive different water patterns in various estuaries. So we can classify an estuary as a salt wedge estuary that's sometimes known as a positive estuary based on the uh, angle of the iso isohaline uh, profiles, which we'll describe in a second. So the salt wedge estuary is a place where rivers are running in to the open estuary and the salt water is coming underneath that freshwater river. Um, and the salt water is more saline, so it goes underneath the freshwater river and the river goes over the salty water, sort of like a freshwater cap or lens. Um, and these are really common in temperate zones. See, this is what you'd see, say, in the Hudson and so forth, where you get river water that's fresh floating, floating as a lens on top of the salt water. And then that salt wedge is going to move back and forth under the river as the tides come in and out. So let's look at the um, salt profile of this estuary. Again, these are the isohaline lines we've discussed before. And you can see the, the salt river water is making it fresher at the surface. And the salt water forms this wedge at the bottom. So the, the shape of the isocline goes um, from at the surface toward the sea end to at the bottom at the, <coughs> at the, um, at the river end. So it's sort of positively facing the river. This gives it that positive name. Often there's a lot of turbulence where the river water and the seawater water meet and that can cause turbidity increases um, and so you get this uh, estuary as shown in profile A um, that's having a, uh, a, large, um, a large influx of fresh water on top of the salt water. The second type of estuary is actually uh, going to be shown in profile B on this diagram, and that's a homogeneous estuary or a more neutral estuary. Uh, these are less common. Um, they're found in warm places like uh, Galveston Bay, Texas, uh, where you get evaporation that's causing the surface water from the river 
to be more salty um, in this hot climate, or there could be very little flow from the river. And so you have very little difference in salinity from surface to bottom. So that gives us a different pattern that we'll discuss again. This is a slide that shows the salt wedge, and you can see the seawater is going to come in underneath as it's denser. The river water is going to be fresher and float on top, and you'll get this mixing zone in between. So we have really high differences in salinity um, between different parts of estuaries. And as we talk about abiotic conditions in estuaries, remember these are extremely variable climates in terms of many uh, locations in terms of many important abiotic factors. So here's the homogeneous estuary description officially. We have Galveston Bay in Texas, and there's a satellite photo of it um, that's separated from the Gulf of Mexico. And often during many times of the year, it's going to be a homogeneous estuary where we have the salinity profile being fairly steady from surface to bottom because evaporation is causing the freshwater input to be more saline. Finally, in, in areas where we have very high evaporation rates, uh, say sometimes off the coast of California or in very uh, semi-arid regions, you can have places where the water, surface water actually is becoming hypersaline in this enclosed system. So ro low river input, the river may have gone through a very arid region, become fairly salty. Um, the lagoon itself, um, where the estuary itself is, may uh, be very stagnant, slow flow through there, and that allows there to be increased evaporation evaporation and increased salinity and then that salt water can actually sink on the on the river end of things and if it's denser than the, the seawater and go beneath the seawater. Um, this is not that common but when it happens this is called an evaporite estuary because you actually have slightly saltier water coming from the river end of the system than you do from the sea end. And so when you look at the profile of this you see the salt water at the bottom uh, being uh, uh, being coming, coming from the river end of things as opposed to coming from the sea end of things because of the high rate of evaporation. So you can actually get a bottom current going from the river toward the sea, which is the opposite of those uh, positive estuaries or salt wedge estuaries that are most common that we talked about first. And finally, we can have intermittent or seasonal estuaries. And these are very common in places that have wet and dry seasons. So in some tropical climates, climates dominated by, by monsoons, where you might only have seasonal rivers that are meeting the semi-enclosed place where the sea is coming into contact with river water. So during some times of the year where there's river flow, you have an estuarine system. And in other times of the year when you don't have a river flow, then you have uh, just an enclosed marshy area. So we call these intermittent or seasonal estuaries. Um, in the dry season, there's very little freshwater inflow, and often you just get a sandbar that's cut off that land, and you end up having just a simple temporary wetland that seasonally is linked to the sea and becoming an estuary. So this would be a picture of a, a, gulf, of, of a coastal California marsh that's a, intermittently a seasonal estuary. So I mentioned that estuaries have just these dramatic changes in abiotic characteristics. Of all the systems we've talked about in class, estuaries have the most temporal and spatial variability in several important abiotic factors. And the first is salinity. These are the most variable places on Earth in terms of their salinity content. So this is the single most important characteristic of estuaries, that their salinity is hugely variable. And that variability is horizontal from the river to the sea. It's vertical from that surface water that could be saltier than the sea or less salty than the sea. And it's seasonal as we get different amounts of fresh water input. Um, so the things that are causing all this variability are that amount of river input, whether it's very warm climate, airy climate, where there's high evaporation, um, if there's uh, any difference in the amount of vertical variability that's being caused by the stratification patterns of salt and fresh water, and the tidal pattern that's pushing salt wedges into the estuaries. And if we look at a profile of temperature and oxygen and salinity um, that was taken over time in a North Carolina marsh, 
you can see here um, the differences in temperature in blue and salinity in pink and dissolved oxygen in yellow uh, over just a short amount of time. So each, uh, each bar uh, on the x-axis is showing you just a one-day period. And so these differences in oxygen, salinity, and temperature are driven in this estuary by the tides coming in and out and you're getting a pulse of water that's a different temperature and a different salinity and a different oxygen concentration as you get seawater and fresh water entering the same point at a fixed measuring station on the marsh. So if you were an organism at that point in the marsh, you would be subject to extreme differences in all three of these very important variables. Here is a diagram from your text that sort of demonstrates that. If you were an organism that was living at point A on the bottom of the estuary, um, during one period, uh, you might end up being at salinity of about 20 to 25 practical salinity units. And then as the tides uh, retract or as you get increased river flow, um, then you're going to end up being at a place that's more 17 to 20 practical salinity units. If you're an intertidal organism in the estuary that's onshore, say on the mud flat, then you could end up being uh, at point B, where at one point you would be covered by the high tide and at uh, 10, uh, 20 practical salinity units, and at the next point you would be dry um, away from the estuary. So um, you get real differences then in that organism's salinity as it might be covered with fresh water during a rain and so forth. So for organisms that are at fixed points in the estuary, they're really combating uh, variable climates. So if we summarize the ways that salt and fresh water can mix, um, and this is a figure courtesy of uh, Dr. Lindbergh, uh, we see that river water, uh, which is uh, essentially zero practical salinity units, is coming from one end of the estuary all the way to sea water at the other. And in salt ridge estuaries, you get this classic pattern of the seawater coming underneath uh, the fresh water. In well-mixed or evaporite estuaries, we can have pretty uh, uniform salinity profiles from top to bottom. Um, in uh, these partially um, mixed estuaries, uh, we end up having uh, different patterns where you can get the, the river water moving back and forth. This would similarly be um, like a salt wedge estuary. And then these reverse estuaries where we actually get so much uh, salinity and, and evaporation occurring uh, on land that the river water coming in is actually saltier than the sea, we can get the reverse pattern of these evaporated estuaries. So what are the other causes of variability that can make salinity even more hard to predict in estuaries? The Chesapeake Bay and several other estuaries are large enough that some of the large-scale water patterns we talked about that are due to the rotation of the earth can occur within the estuary itself. So there's actually a large enough scale that currents and, and water movement and things like the Coriolis effect will also bend the isohaline bars, the salinity patterns within the estuary itself. So you could be standing uh, on one side of the Chesapeake Bay and have a very different salinity than the shore that you're looking at just across the bay. So if we look at the figure from your text showing that, you can see if you were standing, say, um, at the one side of the Potomac River looking across the Chesapeake Bay, you would be maybe 10, 5 or 10 practical salinity units different because you have this bending of the salt profile um, as you go across the, the river due to these currents from the Gulf, uh, Gulf Stream and currents from the, the uh, Coriolis effect. And one thing to remember when we talked about the mud profiles on the muddy shores, we mentioned how mud and sediment can be sort of a barrier to some of the the changes that occur, the abiotic changes that occur in the environment. And most of the estuarine sediments are muddy. So this is another example of a muddy shore. And for organisms that are buried in the mud, they're experiencing much less variability in in conditions than our organisms in the water. And so this diagram shows you a profile of the salinity in the mud, which is very constant, and the salinity in the water um, up right above the mud, which is varying as the tides come in and out. So an organism that's in the mud, because there's less exchange of that bottom water with the water in the, in the sediments, um, is going to be exposed to much fewer of these dramatic changes in salinity than will an organism that's right at the surface of the sediments. So again, soft mud is dominating. This is an example of a muddy shore environment. 
Um, that mud is derived both from uh, marine material that's brought into the estuary, from material that came from rivers and streams, and also from material that was blown in by the wind and material that is just settling from production in the marsh as things die. So very many derivations of the mud that's in the sediments. But the main characteristic, if you drained all the water from an estuary, you would almost always be finding this extreme, thick, muddy, really uh, nutrient-rich sediment. The gradient of sediment size, sort of the, the course to find sediment, is going to vary based on current strength, just like we talked about in the intertidal zone. Um, and storms and floods then are going to be really able to reshape the estuary. So this is one of the reasons that cities often have an ongoing battle with the estuary that they're next to. Because cities people have built, they want their buildings to stay in one space one place, but they're built on the soft sediment. And traditionally, before there were human settlements and hardening of shores, hurricanes and other strong storms would have moved, caused waves and currents that moved the sediment and caused the sediment to naturally move even the river opening to the ocean to move its location. And we try to prevent that because we obviously don't want to cause the human structures to be eroded from the shoreline. And so that's sort of a futile task over long, long periods of time as we're combating this natural tendency of these soft sediments to move as currents are moving them. And this has caused place, problems, for example, in places like New Orleans where we know that the sediments have been shifting and taken away, and we've talked about that with hurricanes and so forth. Other factors that vary in the marsh include temperature. Um, temperature is probably the next most variable um, condition. Um, it, it's a uh, not as variable in those deeper fjord systems, um, but it can be very, very extremely variable in uh, many of the other many of the other estuaries. Um, so you get temperature variation going from the saltwater end to the freshwater end. There's often a small volume of estuary compared with the ocean, so the local climate will affect the temperature and heat it up or cool it down more than in the open ocean itself. That's why the fjord has less of a of a change in temperature because it's a deeper, by nature, deeper system. And so in this case, again, you can see this huge variability in pattern. Um, and if you were in the mud, you would see less of a pattern in temperature. And you can see in these open estuaries, you're getting this large temperature pattern along with the salinity pattern as well. Similarly, that's going to drive oxygen patterns that we'll talk about. Waves are very important um, because we have a long fetch or distance that the wind can blow over in the ocean, you have much larger waves in the ocean itself. Again, that's often why estuaries are considered a safe harbor because you have this barrier that's preventing the wind from blowing over the entire uh, estuary. It, it stops it from going from the open sea to the estuary directly and it will make a smaller fetch in the estuary itself rather than the ocean. So you get wave action, sort of chopping be small waves due to winds there. However, you have all this soft sediment that can get really moved around by those waves, even though they're less dramatic than in the open ocean. Um, you also get currents and water patterns that are due to the river flow coming in and the tidal pattern, and all of this causes this constant shifting of material. So estuaries um, are calmer than the open ocean, less wave action, more muddy habitat, but they often have very complicated tidal patterns. And on some estuaries, uh, such as up in uh, Halifax, uh, where you have the, the bays that have huge amounts of, of tidal inflow, um, you can get tides that are flooding in a huge long distance. Um, and when the water is receded and come back in, these estuaries can fill. And you can actually see in those estuaries the inflow of water as what's called a tidal bore, almost a wall of water that's coming into the, the, the estuary. So these can be very dramatic, complicated patterns that were con traditionally considered very difficult for sailors to navigate through. So we can get really complicated patterns. A lot of uh, physical oceanographers study estuarine uh, water movement patterns. One important physical parameter in estuaries is how fast the water in the estuary is going to move in and out of the system. Um, so uh, this is called flushing time, the time that's required for a given water molecule to um, leave the estuary and a new water molecule to replace it. 
And if we were in class, I'd ask you why that was important. And so if you think about that for a second, not only are the factors on this little diagram important, so you can have a longer time to build up more phytoplankton uh, productivity without it being flushed out, uh, more growth of organisms to eat those, and more recruitment when you have lower flow going through. Um, but also when we have human cities on the estuaries, if the flow rate through the estuary is low and humans are putting pollutants into the estuary, then a low flushing time, a low, a low flow rate um, will, will cause those pollutants to build up in the estuary. Whereas if the flushing time is very fast um, and you don't require much time to move all the water through there, it can cause those pollutants to be flushed right into the open ocean and make the estuary itself purer, although that pollution has just moved out to the open water system. So it's important in estuarine restoration. Another really important characteristic of estuaries is their turbidity. Um, and often these are very turbid systems, and often the productivity of the system is going to be limited by the turbidity that restricts light penetration into the water. Um, often the turbidity is um, not very high at the ocean end and is higher as the river flow that's bringing the particles from the watershed um, is coming into the estuary. Sometimes the turbidity maximum is right at the point where the river is meeting the ocean current and you get a lot of, uh, of suspension of materials and mud from the bottom. So this turbidity decreases light penetration, reduces production, and you can often see this as really sediment-laden water in these estuarine systems. In much of the estuary, oxygen is not a limiting factor. We know that oxygen varies in salt and fresh water just due to physical processes. Um, and the main problem that we get in terms of oxygen in estuaries is when you get these patterns of salt water intrusion at the bottom and fresh water overlying it, so you have these distinct layers of water. And this is a lot like the oxygen the factors that cause the oxygen minimum zone in the ocean that we discussed before, where you have a cap of water that's not allowing mixing with the atmosphere of a lower portion of water. And so in the estuary in the summer when it's warm and there's lots of phytoplankton and they die and sink to the bottom and you have already organic rich sediments at the bottom of the estuary, you can get a lot of uh, bacterial action and respiration that's using the oxygen in that bottom waters. And if there's not much flow back and forth with the open ocean, you can use up oxygen in the bottom waters of the estuary and they can go hypoxic, so low oxygen conditions, or anoxic, no oxygen conditions. And that can cause die off of marine organisms that are in those salty bottom layers. Um, we've increased this problem by causing uh, increases in nutrients that have increased the productivity of the surface waters and increased all that decaying material that's at the bottom. Even when we don't have this stratification patterns, often there's low oxygen in the muddy substrates because they're so oxygen rich and there's so much bacterial respiration there. So if we look at this sort of diagram of human effects on the estuaries and how this can increase the hypoxia or the low oxygen conditions in estuaries, you can see we have sewage effluent and all this other runoff from the watersheds that's fertilizing the phytoplankton blooms. As they die, that material sinks to the bottom. Um, it's decomposing, that's using up the, re the oxygen due to bacterial respiration. That can cause there to be a decrease in the organisms living at the bottom, the benthic organisms, and it can also cause the fish to flee the estuary or to die. Uh, so people often notice these effects as a fish kill. So who does live in the estuaries that are affected by all of these changes? A lot of the biota are going to be very similar to the muddy shores and the salt uh, marshes that we talked about. There are very few things that can tolerate these really variable conditions that we've been mentioning before. So the number of estuarine species is much less in the, salt, in, in the estuary just like it was in the salt marsh compared to the adjacent uh, systems. Their organisms then generally are uh, spatially partitioned between the river end and the ocean end. Some organisms will have a very narrow salt tolerance, and these are known as stenohaline, or steno, remember, means narrow, haline salt, so narrow salinity tolerance. Some will be, have a broad salinity tolerance, and these are known as urihaline. Um, and they can range throughout the whole uh, estuary and not be restricted to one end versus the other.
So some people will refer to um, the organisms that are constrained to freshwater as oligohaline, or they can tolerate few salts. Those that can live in the estuarine water that's brackish as mesohaline, and those that can live in the open salt water as polyhaline as well. So if we look at the, d the diagram from your textbook, you can see that at the ocean end of the estuary, up by salinities of 30 to 35 practical salinity units, we get these narrowly salt tolerant marine species that live in only pure marine water. And there are many of those, it's a high number of species. Um, then as we get toward more and more dilution by fresh water, we get this brackish water that's intermediate, intermediate in salinity. And there are very few species that are specialists on this brackish water. Um, but there are some marine species that can tolerate living in slightly less saline water. And those are the urihaline marine species. And then finally, as we get toward zero practical salinity units um, at the river end, we have freshwater species. So there are very few, few purely estuarine specialists, brackish water specialists, but they can live in a broad section of the marsh that's inaccessible to either the purely terrestrial uh, river species or the purely marine species. Okay, the primary producers um, are generally present, but not very productive, often because of this light limitation. Um, you can get organisms in the water column or on the bottom that are growing, but production within the marsh, autochthonous production, is generally pretty low. However, there's huge amounts of organic material available as food for the organisms that live there. Um, it's either transported from the fringing salt marshes, from the rivers, or the open ocean. So allochthonous production is going to be what's driving much of the higher trophic levels in the marsh. There aren't that many herbivores, which makes sense because we just said there weren't that many plants that were actually in the estuary itself. And detritus is generally considered the base of that estuarine food web. So bacterial and fungal production and colonization is very important at converting all that detritus into uh, into other sources of energy. And you get filter feeding organisms that can persist on detritus, such as rib mussels that are shown here. And we talked about those in the salt marsh section. There are a limited number of large plants. Often there's seagrasses near shore, um, but they depend on there being adequate light. Um, there's often problems with attaching in these anoxic muds, and there's low light penetration. So some seagrasses, um, fringing salt marshes, so fringing you'd find Spartina and those other salt marsh plants we talked about, and a few benthic algae, microscopic algae like diatoms, some filamentous cyanobacteria. But again, the productivity of these things is low. Um, just patchy seaweeds and macroalgae. And here's a good example of sea grass beds that are off of an estuarine area. Again, you would depend on adequate light to build these seagrass beds, and we mentioned a lot about seagrass systems earlier in the class. And here's some common uh, macroalgae that you might find if there's some rocky substrate available and Spartina that are fringing, and we mentioned salt marshes before. So often the salt marshes are lining our estuaries. In terms of what's in the open water, there's really a reduced number of plankton. Um, we have some phytoplankton, and estuaries tend to be dominated by one of two kinds of uh, phytoplankton that we mentioned when we talked about the open ocean, either diatoms or dinoflagellates. Um, and sometimes dinoflagellates can be responsible for toxic blooms in estuaries. Those phytoplankton are consumed by numerous kinds of zooplankton, especially copepods, like in the open ocean, although often different species dominate, some mycids and some amphipods. And all of these things, their abundance and their productivity are going to depend on that flushing rate and how much time they have to grow in the estuary before being swept out to the sea. So here are the, it's an example of a common uh, dinoflagellate and diatom. Phytoplankton are often uh, limited by both nitrogen as its limiting nutrient and also by light. <clears throat> the zooplankton are often limited by either phytoplankton or by the currents that are sweeping them out to sea before their populations build up. It's estimated that in estuaries, over half of the phytoplankton production is consumed by the zooplankton in the, in the estuary, and the rest of the phytoplankton are settling into the estuary uh, and taken up by filters or, or serve as detritus at the bottom. <clears throat> 
Here's a nice photo that I like uh, from Dr. Lindbergh who works on larval fish in estuaries. And this is a common estuarine plankton, Bosmina, on the upper left. And this is a larval herring. And you can see in the gut of the larval herring uh, these little tiny Bosmina that have been consumed by the fish. So if you look under the vertebrae there, you can see these three little Bosmina that have been eaten. So the zooplankton are a really important source of food to larval fish and small organisms in the marsh as well. So that's how that phytoplankton energy is transferred to upper trophic levels. We also get a lot of larval stages of economically important species in estuaries. Um, often we have crab larval stages. In addition, we can get blooms of various kinds of jellies, like tenophores, um, in addition to normal uh, cnidarian jellyfish. Historically, the waters in estuaries may have been less turbid than they are today, in part because many northeastern estuaries were really coated with huge beds of oysters. Um, and these are, were called oyster reefs. And when Europeans arrived uh, to the east coast of North America, they found these vast beds of oysters. And it's estimated that all the water in the Chesapeake Bay was filtered through the gut of an oyster every single day when the oysters were at the natural levels. And that would have greatly reduced the particles that were in the water. So the estuarine systems we see today may be greatly altered in part because we've reduced the number of mollusks that are filtering the water every day. Um, so there's a great interest in restoring these oyster reefs, um, not just because of, of interest in human eating of oysters and cultivation of oysters, but also to provide those ecosystem services of filtration in the marsh. Just like in the muddy shores, there are tons of crabs in these muddy systems that are burrowing and aerating the soils and eating the detritus and scavenging. Um, we also have a lot of the similar organisms that we talked about in the muddy shores uh, that are burrowing and uh, often eating detritus uh, and scavenging uh, dead material. Um, often you get this connectivity between the ocean and these uh, estuarine systems where larval stages will come into the system and, and uh, propagate and grow um, and these oysters and so forth will take up the energy from the ocean and, and material that's come in as well as productivity from the estuary itself. Some of the organisms that live in the estuary only come in and out of the estuary during parts of their life cycle. So we have fish that migrate in and out. We have shrimp that spend parts of their larval stages in estuaries, and then they're adults at the open sea. And they're all, the estuaries serve an important function as breeding grounds uh, for many kinds of, of birds and animals and fishes. Shrimp are a very important seasonal component of estuaries. And you may remember during the Gulf oil spill, there was great concern that a critical larval stage, juvenile stage of the shrimp might be coming into the estuaries at the time of the spill. And you could actually wipe out a year class of shrimp potentially by having that critical stage uh, be at the point of entering into some of the estuaries and be oiled at the time that they were uh, moving uh, there and the oil spill occurred. So this nursery function can be important for many kinds of organisms. Some, some organisms are resident in the estuary, several kinds of, of fish like mummy chugs, uh, mullets and drums and mud skippers. Um, we get fish that are going out to sea to breed and living in rivers that pass through estuaries like eel. And we get fish that are coming in to, to rivers to breed. Um, all of these are really important uh, to local fishermen, such as uh, fishing for stripers and uh, American shad seasonally. Um, we also get seasonal visitors, lots of flatfish on these muddy substrates, and so forth. And there are a lot of other diverse biota, often lots of birds that people are interested in, uh, protecting that come seasonally. Um, we get uh, various kinds of, uh, of reptiles uh, as well. The adaptations of the organisms to live in these harsh climates are really similar to those we talked about in the muddy intertidal system so, and in the mangrove system. So we'll just uh, re reiterate a few of those right now. First, um, plants often have arenchyma, which allows them these uh, porous um, spaces in the tissue that allow them to bring oxygen to the roots. Because as we mentioned, it's a very difficult thing for a plant to be living in salty anaerobic sediment. 
Um, the burrowing animals often will make burrows in which they can pump uh, oxygen from the overlying water and not rely on the lack of oxygen in the, in the sediments there. Um, also, the animals often have extra um, blood pigments um, that have high affinities for oxygen. So they're really, really good at taking up oxygen at low concentrations. We tend to see a lot of energy being expended by organisms to try to deal with the changes between salt and fresh water. And there are two general ways that organisms can deal with these changes. One is they can just tolerate fluctuations in their own internal salinity. So um, the, the water may become more salty and less salty as the tides go in and out, um, and their own internal chemistry becomes more and less salty, and they're just able to tolerate that fluctuation in salinity without tissue damage. Um, and so these are called osmoconformers because if you look at this profile of the salinity of water um, versus the salinity of blood, a perfect osmoconformer would have the salinity of the water uh, be increasing and the salinity of the blood increasing exactly in line with that. Um, so some organisms, like the polychaete worm that's shown there, are fairly well able to do that. If you look at the figure, you also see that several organisms, like the crab, looks like it keeps a steady, fairly steady salinity in its own blood until it reaches a point at which it can't maintain that anymore, and then it conforms uh, with the, the external salinity, whereas other organisms are very good at maintaining constant salinity. So that ability to regulate one's own internal salinity it's called osmoregulation. And so there are lots of physiological mechanisms like gills and kidneys and special cells like we talked about in uh, fish gills uh, that are able to exchange salt at an energetic cost and maintain the osmotic balance of the organism. Um, often you can see things like this uh, polychaete worm um, that will change in weight after being transferred from seawater to a uh, dilution of seawater, in this case one-fifth seawater. And initially what they'll do is they'll, they won't be able to regulate their own internal salinity and they'll take up salt water um, as they get into the dilute water and then they're able to pump that back out and maintain their own salinity. So there can be a, a time lag between their ability to be exposed to a more dilute fluid rapid rapidly in their ability to osmoregulate perfectly. And when they are able to do that, you can see um, they can regulate at this very low salinity and then they often conform um, and osmoconform and tolerate a fairly wide change of salinity between say uh, 15 and 35 practical salinity units. Here we go, another example of a crab here that osmoconforms at high salinities and then regulates and expends energy at low salinities when it's really dilute. Plants can also excrete salts, um, and we talked about this in some mangrove plants in Spartina. They'll deposit salts on leaf surfaces. Some of them will shed leaves that they have sequestered salts in to get rid of those salts. Um, and again, just like in the salt marsh, things like salicornia are, can be succulent, uh, like desert plants to deal with water balance. Water and salt balance are highly linked. And so the succulent strategy of being filled with water can help to balance this input of salinity and maintain an overall uh, functional body osmotic concentration. Here's a good example of a picture of a mangrove excreting salt. You can see the salt crystals on the leaf and salicornia, one of those classic succulent uh, near shore plants in, wet, in uh, salt marshes and estuaries. We have these crabs that have differences in salinity regulation ability, and sometimes those differences extend through juvenile phases and adult phases. So here you can see an adult crab uh, that's in the river and able to tolerate fresh water. Um, in the estuary, we have the crab migrating with eggs. They release their larvae in the open ocean, and those come back into the estuary. So the adult crabs are able to tolerate this river water salinity, but the juvenile crabs can't, and so they're staying in the open sea until they've developed the ability to osmoregulate effectively and tolerate fresh water. We can also divide estuaries into two basic types depending on whether they have salt marshes lining them commonly or not. Um, 
European salt marshes, tr European estuaries traditionally did not have extensive salt marshes. And so European estuaries are much more like the mud flat systems we talked about. They have mud flats with few large plants, some benthic small organisms that are photosynthesizing there. And most of their productivity is coming from the river or from the sea. There's not a lot of primary producers or plants there. This, these are allochthonous driven marshes. They're receiving energy from other systems because they don't have lots of plant productivity. Whereas American type marshes are extensively lined with salt marshes, like you can see here. Um, and so they have small mud flats, um, but they also have a lot of plants photosynthesizing and producing material autochthonously within the marsh. And so they have extra energy that's produced within the marsh and they're subsidized also by the energy from the river and the sea. So American type estuaries can be extremely productive because they don't only get energy from outside of the system, but they also have all of this energy being produced within the system itself. And this is one of the reasons that the Chesapeake and the Hudson Bay estuaries and so forth were so colonized by people coming from the old world because these were great sources of fish and shellfish due to all of this excess productivity in these American type marshes. The second trophic level in these marshes then tends to be all these suspension feeders that can tolerate eating detritus and not just plankton, detritus feeders in the benthos, um, and they're consumed by predators. There's lots of omnivory in the marsh. We also get lots of birds, as I mentioned, that are visiting the marsh. And there's been a lot of interesting ecological work done on how the length of the bills is very well correlated with the type of organisms that these birds are trying to get out of the soil. Um, when people have excluded birds from hat patches of the, the mud flats around the uh, estuaries, you find that the birds are likely cropping about 4 to 20 percent of the organisms that are living in the mud. So they make a substantial dent on the, the organisms in the mud and are a main source of mortality for these organisms. So we get a really complicated estuarine food web. It's driven by detritus coming from the river and the sea, by productivity within the marsh from algae and from higher plants and from phytoplankton in the open water. Um, and all of those things are fed on by filter feeders and detritivores. And those are feeding the things that humans tend to harvest from the marsh, like the various fish um, and some of the invertebrates like shrimp. And then they're also harvested by uh, birds and other organisms that humans often have place an aesthetic value you on. Um, so it's a very interesting system. We haven't talked too much about the, about the microbial component, but there's an active microbial component in the mud, just as there was in the muddy substrates. And this is also linked between the salt marsh grasses that are higher in the estuary and the open ocean. And you get lots of back and forth movement of these creatures that links the estuary to the open ocean system as well. So that's the end of salt marshes for today. I'm, I'm sorry, of estuaries for today. Think about how the estuarine system links with the salt marshes and links with these productive nearshore habitats that we've talked about. Classically, estuaries have been a real problem in terms of human use of estuaries. It's estimated that more than 80% of estuaries are severely degraded. And as we discuss human conservation issues and places of concern, we'll be talking about estuaries again in terms of the ways that we can restore some of the natural functions of estuaries. Thanks very much. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.